We have four really great presenters today. We'll have Dr. Terry Gentry from Texas A&M, Sean Donovan from the San Antonio River Authority, and Mark Enders from City of New Braunfels, as well as Dr. Christina Lopez from the Plum Creek Watershed Partnership today. Um, I am going to just briefly go over a few items about the TMDL program before we get started. So for those of you that aren't familiar with COG, we are a voluntary association of local governments that was established in 1966. Uh, we assist members in planning for common needs and cooperating for mutual benefit. So what does the COG um, TMDL program focus on? We focus on bacterial impairments, specifically for E. coli, which is why we're having today's bacterial source tracking webinar. Uh, many things can cause impairments, such as pet waste, illicit discharges, wildlife waste, and more. Um, and so it's important to address these impairments in order for our waterways to meet their designated use, such as recreation, so that TMDL or a budget is set to ensure that they can safely maintain that use. So in North Central Texas, there are currently 23 impaired waterways in the I plan shown on the map here. And the most recent addition was North Fork Fish Creek and the Mountain Creek Lake Tributaries Watershed. So through the I plan, COG works with local governments and members to implement best management practices to reduce bacteria sources, participation in regional initiatives, such as the Wastewater and Treatment Education Roundtable, integrated stormwater management program and other education and outreach methods. The iPlan also guides projects and workshops selected by members like today's workshop. Um, the coordination committee and subcommittees also direct the creation of resources. And we have an array of resources related to TMDL, including educational explainer videos, resources for septic systems, resources for discouraging people to feed the ducks and geese and other avian um, birds, and then also encouraging pet owners to always pick up after their pet. COG also distributes quarterly newsletters and an annual program summary, which highlight other activities in the region. And we also have, like I said, lots of workshops and webinars as well. Um, these resources are all available on the TMDL webpage under the green banner labeled resources, as well as the green banner labeled septic system resources as well. Awesome. So Dr. Gentry is a professor and director of the Soil and Aquatic Microbiology Laboratory in the Soil and Crop Sciences Department at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on the use of molecular technologies to detect and identify microbial pathogens from animal, human, and natural sources, along with the characterization of microbial populations and communities contributing to applied processes, such as the bioremediation of organic and metal contaminants and sustainability of intensive crop systems. He is the author or co-author of 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, 16 book chapters, and 267 presentations, in addition to being co-editor of leading textbooks on soil and environmental microbiology. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in soil and water microbiology and environmental microbiology, along with a Brazilian agriculture study abroad course. He has chaired and co-chaired 17 PhD students and 22 master's level students, and he has also supervised 11 postdoctoral research associates. So Dr. Gentry, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Hannah. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk with you and share some of the work that my group has done on source tracking for characterizing watersheds. And this upfront uh, mention that this is a collaboration with people at Texas Water Resources Institute, including Dr. Lucas Gregory, and UT School of Public Health in El Paso, including Dr. Christina Mena. And so in terms of the presentation, what I'll do is talk a little background about source tracking, some examples of some of the methods and very brief examples of what the results would look like. And then lastly, some things to potentially consider if you're thinking about implementing a source tracking project. So up front, the goal is try to determine where the fecal contamination is coming from. So usually we're going into a watershed, there's been evidence of impairment due to high levels of fecal indicator bacteria. And in order to do some type of practice to reduce that, it's be good to know where it is coming from in order to initiate the proper remediation strategies. The idea behind source tracking is based on that the bacteria or the organisms are unique enough in the different sources that we can differentiate them after the fact in the water sample. There's a large number of methods that have been used, and we'll talk about a few examples of these. 
And often it works best as multiple methods in combination because each method has its advantages and disadvantages. So many times it can be advantageous to have multiple methods to use simultaneously. Now you may have also heard the term microbial source tracking, and basically that means the same thing as bacterial source tracking. And I'll use the term bacterial source tracking because the organisms we've looked at have been primary bacteria, specifically E. coli and Bacteroides, but other things can be used as well. Some people looked at bacteriophages or viruses that infect bacteria, human viruses, even animal cells themselves, and also chemicals, things like caffeine or optical brighteners from laundry detergents can be very helpful in determining sources coming from sewage or septage at times. So depending on the project, different things can be useful, but in terms of what we've done primarily with my group, it's targeting E. coli and Bacteroides. Now, in terms of the methods, I'm going to group these into three broad categories as we talk about them. And there's a huge number of things that have been tested and new ones that are coming online. But the first being the culture based or library dependent approach. And in this case, we isolate the bacteria, use the E. coli, and we do some type of phenotypic or genotypic characterization of those. So the phenotypic could be like an antibiotic resistance profile, the genotypic can be something DNA based. And then we compare those isolates back against the known source samples or isolates from known source samples. And this is where a lot of the cost comes in in this approach is that in order to do this, we have to develop a large library from a large number of known source samples. Now, in contrast with the marker based approach, which is largely library independent, we extract the DNA directly from the samples and we use PCR based markers to detect and or quantify these different markers. And generally, these are very source specific, so they may be for humans they may be for ruminants or other animal classes. And then the last one I'll touch on this briefly is a sequencing based source tracking approach where we take the water sample, we extract the DNA and we sequence either specific genes or just everything that's in that. And we use that to determine what portion of the community in that sample is coming from different known sources. So potential contaminants from humans and other sources. So I'll touch on that one a little bit at the end. But in terms of what's been done and used historically in Texas, the main one's been the culture dependent approach. And this goes back over two decades in Texas where there's been a long history of source tracking and one of the major first projects was the Lake Waco, Lake Waco Belton project that was initiated in 2002 with funding from the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. And this was done by George D. Giovanni, who's with Texas A&M El Paso at the time, Joanna Mott, who was with A&M Corpus Christi at the time, and Suresh Pillai, who was at A&M College Station. And one of the main outcomes of this was recommending source tracking approaches to be used in Texas at that time and going forward. And again, there were a lot of different methods that were available at the moment. It's picking the ones that work best. And one of the recommendations that came out of this, or one of the findings, is that a two method approach, such as using ERIC, which is a DNA fingerprinting approach in combination with antibiotic resistance analysis, or ERIC in combination with another fingerprinting approach, RP or riboprinting, seem to work the best. Followed up on this was the Texas Bacteria TMDL Task Force, which issued a report in 2002, which they further recommended and confirmed that the ERIC RP combined approach was the recommended source tracking approach. And this has been the core of the source tracking that my group and George D. Giovanni and later Christina Mena's group at El Paso has been doing in Texas over the last couple of decades. And to do this, we take our water sample, isolate E. coli using EPA method 1603. And that's one of the key things on this is we have to have the individual isolates. And one of the challenges with this approach is that there aren't that many commercial labs in Texas that do the 1603 approach. Many do the IDEX approach. So even if we're doing the IDEX, we have to flip over and use a culture based method to be able to get the colonies to do this. But once we have the colonies, we'll do our DNA fingerprinting and compare that back against our library for a source ID. And in terms of the fingerprinting, this is where we do the combined ERIC PCR and riboprinting approach. And both of these are just based on differences in sequences and the location of different elements in the genomes of the bacteria. An example of ERIC PCR, this would be one E. coli isolate in this band, in this, this lane, and this would be another E. coli isolate. And you can see the different banding pattern depending on where these different elements were in the genomes of the bacteria. And then on the right, same type of thing with the riboprinting, which is an automated system for DuPont looking at 16S ribosomal RNA genes. But again, you can see a different banding pattern for isolate one versus isolate two. We'll then take these two banding patterns, put them together to generate one banding pattern fingerprint for each isolate. 
and then compare that back against our known source library. Now, the advantages of this approach is it's more discriminating from a genetic perspective than if we were using something that was phenotypic like antibiotic resistance analysis. It will allow us to actually go in and rank the sources, but it's relatively expensive. And a big reason for that expense is the need to develop that known source library, which may encompass hundreds of isolates for each individual project. And one way we've tried to reduce this is largely through funding from the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board over the last few decades, is develop a Texas E. coli BST library that rather than er for every new project, go in and have to collect hundreds of known source samples for just that project, is try to do this comprehensively across the state where for a new project, we, we may add a handful of new isolates, but we can take advantage of the ones we've added in previous projects. In the current version of this library, we have over 1900 E. coli isolates that have been collected from over 1600 different human animal samples but we've screened over 7,000 isolates to get those 1,900 isolates. And the reason there's a far fewer than a library than what we screen is we try to pick the ones that appear to be the most host specific. So we'll, we'll segregate out the ones that don't appear to be host specific. And these have been collected from numerous watersheds around the state. And the map this illustrates some of the watersheds we worked in uh, throughout Texas. And additionally, as we go into new watersheds or we go back to a watershed we haven't been to in a while, we'll collect new isolates and add them into the library and continually update it. And usually we update this library about once every year or two. In fact, we expect to have a new version of the library come out in the next couple months. And then when we have the results, we will typically express them as either a three-way or a seven-way split of the host classes. So with a three-way, that would be coming from a human source, livestock and pets, or wildlife. And then for the seven-way, we split this out a little more finely, where humans still get their own source class. We'll split out the livestock and pets into pets, cattle, other livestock, avian, other livestock, non-avian, and split out wildlife into avian and non-avian. Now, there are some considerations with this. One is there's obviously a lot larger number of different wildlife species than domesticated animal species. And that's one of the things up front is we'll talk to the stakeholders and try to see what they think are the major sources and make sure we have those, especially like the wildlife represented adequately in the library. If there isn't, then we'll try to target some of those for getting known source samples to include in the library. Similarly, if we're going into a new location we haven't been to before or we're going back into one we haven't been in in several years, we may add more new isolates in the library just to make sure we have that covered. And then one we're still challenged or stress wrestling with how to address is the, is the occurrence or existence of cosmopolitan strains. And this could be strains, for, for example, E. coli that may be found in you and also your dog or your pet or other animals in close proximity. So E. coli that may be found in different animals. And we can kind of sort this out in the library, but if we find that in a water sample, we don't have a real good way to be able to differentiate that out after the fact. And then lastly, one of the things to consider versus the three-way or seven-way split is the number of isolates that we process for a project. And usually what drives this is the budget. And if we're doing a relatively small project with a relatively small number of isolates, we may restrict or just focus on a three-way split versus a seven-way split because with every one of these additional source categories, we lose a little bit of accuracy on our ID. So if we're doing a smaller project, we may try to focus in just on a three-way split. What do the results look like? And Dr. Lopez may share more of this in terms of Plum Creek, but this is some work we did at Plum Creek with a three-way split of E. coli isolates using the library dependent approach. And it's showing this on the y-axis is the percentage of the sources each one of these E. coli isolates were matched back into. And we have five different sampling locations. The green bars being the isolates were matched back to a wildlife source. The blue, the ones domesticated animals and livestock, red human sources, and the gray being sort E. coli we couldn't match back to source, so the source was unidentified. And typically anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the E. coli come back this way in under normal watershed conditions. But just big take home from this is that the biggest fraction appear to be coming from wildlife and the second biggest fraction from livestock and domesticated animals with relatively small proportions of, of human hits that are there. Now if we wanted to get more fine than that and look at individual species beyond just humans. So look at ruminants or specific horses or birds or even hogs. It is another way to do that is use marker-based analysis, and this would be a library independent source tracking approach. 
The most common of these markers targets a group of bacteria called Bacteroidales, which are actually more numerous in fecal material than E. coli is. And there are a lot of really specific markers out there for different groups, including ruminants and humans and horses. One downside is that there are relatively few markers for different wildlife species. So if you have a watershed, you think there's large wildlife contributions, then this it's going to be difficult to use this type of approach to capture all of that. Additionally, the relationship between E. coli or the regulatory organism and pathogens between these library independent or marker based assays isn't real well defined in a lot of cases. And additionally, some of these markers are incredibly specific, but generally there's a trade off between specificity and sensitivity. So in terms of which ones will work for you, it's going to kind of depend on your tolerance for false positives versus false negatives. Another thing that's important to consider on this is if you're using these markers, many times they were developed in different parts of the country or even different countries in the United States, and it's important to ground truth them locally. An example of one of these we evaluated a few years ago, and this is a poultry marker developed by Jody Harwood's lab at the University of South Florida. And we screened this with, with poultry samples from across the state of Texas and a lot of non-target samples. And, and we did confirm that this one has a really high rate of specificity. We only found, found one false positive test that was on that. And in terms of the poultry litter, it was quite sensitive as well. We had some false negatives, but generally it would, came back as positive on most of the poultry litter, litter samples we tested. So it looks like a really good marker to potentially use in, in Texas. And I see you have a question. So the question in the chat is, are feral hogs included in the wildlife or livestock categories? Is we currently include, and I'll go back to the results here, we include feral hogs in the wildlife category. And I know a lot of wildlife people especially don't like that but that's we don't have a separate category for invasives we went in and we've looked in the past at splitting feral hogs out as their own category and there was such overlap with the other groups that we couldn't do that now that's in our current plan with the current source tracking project that we're looking at it's funded through the state soil water conservation board we're hoping to go back in and reevaluate that and give it another attempt to try to split it out with the concerns about feral hogs and the fact that including them in wildlife probably isn't the best way to handle that, especially given that they have a, a very different management potential than other life, or wildlife species. But at the moment, to answer that question, we're including the feral hogs. And interestingly, and Dr. Lopez may talk about this, but a large portion of these E. coli that were identified as wildlife, their closest match when we compare it back to library was actually from feral hogs. So an interesting aside to that. How would the marker-based assays work? Well, in this case, take a water sample, extract the DNA, do PCR amplification, either for presence, absence, or quantitative approach. And the advantage of this over the library dependent is it can be much less expensive when you talk about on a sample basis. And also it can happen much more rapidly. And so you can have results here in days versus potentially weeks with a library dependent type approach. And some example data, this is a watershed from East Texas where we did work using the presence absence test for different markers and the y-axis would be the percentage of samples in which these markers were detected so this is presence and absence we saw over 90 percent of the samples had some indication of general fecal contamination which is not surprising given that there had high levels of e coli as well but in terms of the more specific markers we found most frequently it was the ruminant marker the rural watershed makes some sense and we saw the hog marker at nearly 30% of the samples. And since there wasn't much domesticated hog production, we're attributing this as being most likely coming from feral hogs. And we only saw human contamination in a relatively small percentage of the samples. But this is presence absence. This doesn't tell us anything about abundance. And so if we're trying to do this quantitatively, we'd have to use a quantitative type approach. And to give an example of this is we did a project in the Houston area following the flooding after Hurricane Harvey a few years ago down near Clear Lake in the southeastern part of the city. And this was done in connection with Michael LaMontagne at the University of Houston Clear Lake, where as soon as the roads were passable, we went in and collected samples while flooding was still there. And then every week or two after that for around two months until the flooding had, was gone for several weeks. And we measured the E. coli, and we also used quantitative PCR markers for both general fecal contamination and human-specific contamination. And show the E. coli results first. 
So this is the E. coli, most probable number per 100 males, just done with a typical IDEX test. Is the first sample we pulled when there was still a lot of flooding present. You can see all samples at all six sites were elevated above the standards. But relatively quickly, when the flooding started receding, is it fell down at or near or below the, the standard until this last event when it, there was a little bit of rainfall right before that is probably why some of these numbers jumped up a little bit. But definitely higher levels of E. coli during the flooding, as you would expect, with potentially more fecal contamination in there. When we look at the qPCR marker for general fecal contamination, we see a somewhat similar trend. And this is based on bacteroid yeast with high levels of maximum flooding. And as the waters recede, those numbers tend to drop down. But when we look at human specific marker, we see a very different story. So in this case, rather than that flooded sample having the highest number or highest concentration, it's among the lowest. And it does spike as the flood waters are receding and then it starts dropping back down again. So what's going on with this? Is so does that mean that there's less human fecal contamination happening during all that flooding that occurred? Probably not, but the concentration was lower, likely because of all that rainwater that came in that diluted it out. If we could show this as a load, it would probably be really elevated here under the flooding. But we did see as the water started receding and the water's concentrating and those human fecal contamination sources are probably still existing. We did see that spike as those waters started receding. But interestingly, what would cause all that contamination here? So if we go back to the E. coli numbers, definitely there's more fecal contamination coming from somewhere. So if it isn't coming from human, where's it coming from? And so what would normally be here, maybe coming from wildlife, maybe coming from pets, maybe coming from other livestock and domesticated animals in the area. And so this is a good example of using a specific marker to get a little more fine story about what's occurring beyond just the general E. coli and fecal contamination. And the last approach I'll talk about is a newer one. This is sequencing based source tracking where we take the sample and we will either from animal fecal material to generate our, our sequence library or from environmental water extract the DNA, do sequencing that and use the software programs such as source tracker and there's a few other ones available now to predict the source categories for the microbiome that's present in that water sample. And there are a few studies out there now that have demonstrated this can be very effective. And one example of this is work at Jim, uh, Mike Sadowski's lab at the University of Minnesota where they evaluated samples spiked with different fecal mixtures and what they reported was 91% accuracy in identifying sources with no false negatives and a strong correlation between the contributions and the volume spiked. Now with that said, it wasn't perfect. And just look at a couple examples down below. In this case, they expected 2% contribution from these different sources. You can see some of those are relatively comparable. Wastewater treatment effluent at 11%, but dog was overestimated, for example, at 44%. Also, the bottom one here, it was just spiked with dog, and the majority of the results came back as indicated dog was a primary contaminant, but it did indicate a little bit of a false positive signal for wastewater treatment effluent, a little bit of a false positive for horse as well. And so really good potential here. We haven't tested this, and this is one of the plans we're, we're hoping to do starting this summer is initiate a project in Texas in a watershed where we're evaluating these source tracking approaches using the sequencing and one of the big advantages of this if we can do this it would dramatically reduce the cost of the source tracking projects but ultimately at the end of the day no matter what source tracking results you do and what approach is used it's important to reconcile that with multiple other lines of evidence is not interpret that alone and so tie that back in with your e coli enumeration data and land use watershed source survey modeling if it's available and then also even before and after the project is talk to the stakeholders, get an idea of what the potential sources are. Are there any sources that if you're doing the library dependent approach aren't represented in the library and make sure we get new samples in that would include that. And just the common sense, making use of the stakeholder input and the potential major sources in the watershed. And then lastly, a couple things in terms of if you want to start a source tracking project, some things to consider where well, there's a variety of commercial labs that do source tracking, also governmental labs beyond mine and Dr. Menas at El Paso, Vikram Kapoor at UT San Antonio, and Jeffrey Turner at AM Corpus Christi both do source tracking work in Texas. And one thing you want to consider is what is your goal of your project? 
Are you wanting to comprehensively characterize a watershed? Or are you concerned about the specific sources? And if you can focus in on just one source, let's say human, then a marker based approach may be your best option. But if you need to consider all sources, including wildlife, then a library dependent approach where you can capture those wildlife contributions may be needed. And then also what river level of resolution do you need? Do you, again, do you need the individual species or can you group them based on potential management options? And so humans and domesticated animals and wildlife and unfortunately, we can't split feral hogs out, but if you could have a separate feral hog category. And then another thing would be whether you, you need presence absence results or that's sufficient. You need a relative ranking or you need some type of absolute quantification. And all those can play a role in terms of which approach would be best. Now, in terms of the cost, it's going to vary widely depending on how many samples, the scope of the project, the duration of the project and the method used. Just to throw some numbers out there is in terms of our library dependent projects, we're analyzing E. coli isolates and we're doing the two method fingerprint. Our current cost for the two method Eric RP fingerprint is $250 an isolate. For the marker based analysis, we're doing a general isolate with one marker, it's 250. The general marker and four markers is 325. And with a sequencing based approach, I can't give you a current estimate because we're just now starting to evaluate it, but it does have the potential to dramatically reduce the cost of initiating and conducting these projects in the state. And just kind of put this in an example scenario, if we did a watershed with three sites, we're sampling monthly for a year, and we're doing five E. coli isolates per sample, that'd be a total of 180 isolates at 250 samples, so be $45,000. And so this gives you kind of a ballpark. It could be less than this. It could be more than this, depending on the scope and the methods we use. And this would just include the lab analysis. It wouldn't include the sample collection and all the other additional fees to get the sample to the lab. So that is the last I had. I'm be glad to try to answer any questions you have, or if you have questions later, feel free to contact me. Here's my email address and phone number. And, and thank you, and I look forward to hearing the examples coming up from some of these projects that have been done in Texas. Thank you. How often would you recommend, if at all, doing these sorts of um, bacterial source tracking? So as I'm going to talk about in Plum Creek, we had one in 2018. Do they need to be done every like 10 years or something? What do you recommend for that? So it, it depends on the watershed and how rapidly it's changing. So if you're in a location where there hasn't been much development and the source contributions have been probably pretty consistent over the years, it may not be needed to do it as frequently. In a location like yours where it's, it's rapidly changing and getting developed, then doing it more frequently might be advantageous. Now with that said, you may not need to do it at the same scope you did before. And so it just really depends and I would try to focus the efforts on where you're seeing the highest counts. So from before, I haven't looked at the numbers in E. coli of E. coli in Plum Creek recently, but before there, there's a little bit of a spread in terms of the ones where you had higher levels. So that's definitely where I'd focus the efforts. Uh, but it just depends on the watershed, I would say. It's the ones that are changing more rapidly, maybe go back in more frequently, but the ones that are relatively constant probably isn't needed as much. In fact, when we looked at these primarily rural watersheds over the state, there's a remarkable amount of consistency in terms of the sources that we see. Now, when we do that, it's largely at a relatively high scale. If we went in and we looked at a lot more finely, get more sampling locations, we may see different results. But when we look at it kind of as a watershed average, we see a lot more consistent results. So that, that's a long answer to your question. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, it's probably not needed to go in there real frequently to do these types of projects. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hannah, you to address? I'm sorry, yes, if you want to start at the top with Blake's question and work your way down, we can do that. Sure. And so. Yes, so if you collect a sample in the field, there, in these projects, usually we, we define everything up front. And we've done it a variety of ways. One is the person brings a sample to us. And we'd like to get these within a regular E. coli hold time, so within six hours if we can. If that can't be done, we can expand the hold time to 24 hours on ice. And so we've had for the local samples, somewhere in driving distance, people can deliver them to the lab. In other cases, that are a little farther out, we've FedExed them overnight and, and keep them on ice. So there's a few different options in terms of getting samples to the lab. 
Um, so hopefully that answers Blake's question. In terms of Jeffrey, how long does it take to get the results? It's going to depend on the assay. Usually for the larger projects, we try to get the results for a sampling time back within a month. And in terms of how long it takes us to do it, we could probably do it in a week with everything working optimally, but we have to fit it in our other workflow. And then on top of that right now, as I'm sure everybody's aware, all the supply chain issues of making getting supplies challenging from time to time. So hopefully we would try to get results back to you within a month would be the goal if we know up front. And I see Michael's on here. Hi, Michael. Uh, does using BST with E. coli have added value because E. coli accounts are used by water quality managers? So I would say yes. And that's one of the potential advantages of using an E. coli based approach is a lot closer direct connection with the regulatory organism. Now, with that said, there's a lot of limitations with the E. coli approach, so it may be better to use one that isn't. But if you can use an E. coli approach, I think that's definitely something that makes it a lot cleaner to interpret and it's a lot cleaner to explain to stakeholders, I've found, is if you can share an E. coli and say, it looks like the majority of E. coli is coming from here rather than talking about, okay, we're talking about E. coli here and we're talking about bacteria here and we have different die-offs and transport. And it, it makes it a lot easier if you're using the same organism. And then Julian, is the amount of human source bacteria influenced by illicit sewer connections, sanitary floors, or septic tanks? I would think runoff would transport bacteria from septic tanks and that would be similar to animal contributions, but illicit connections would not be influenced or affected by runoff. I would expect that's true. Uh, generally, what we're doing is just looking at what's in the water rather than dealing with the runoff and how it got there. But if you're trying to determine that after or go backwards and see the ultimate source of this, I would suspect illicit discharge would obviously have a much more direct, higher impact than what would be coming out of leaking from septic tanks and other sources. Uh, Michael's question, is the E. coli same from sewers or septic tanks? Yes and no is how I would answer that one. And so obviously with septic tanks, we have a fewer number of individuals contributing to that. And so it's still gonna be a human E. coli, the same as you'd see in a sewer, but it's gonna be a lot simpler community of E. coli most likely because it's coming from a fewer number of individuals than what you see coming from sewer. Now, if you're asking about numbers, that's gonna really depend on the septic tank in the sewer and how that septic tank works in the process. And then going back to Julian's question, how long it traveled through the soil before it got to the water, which could dramatically impact how much of the E. coli survived before it got in the water body. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question well, Michael, but feel free to, to follow up with me if I did. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gentry. Appreciate you. you giving this presentation. So um, our next presenter is Sean Donovan. He is the manager of the Environmental Sciences Department and has been with the San Antonio River Authority since 2012. He was originally hired as an aquatic biologist and worked his way to the senior aquatic biologist position before being promoted to management. In his time with the River Authority, he has been instrumental in developing and expanding proactive ecological restoration efforts throughout the basin, including fish and mussel reintroductions. He is a certified fisheries professional and an active member of the American Fisheries Society and is a certified project management professional. Sean received his bachelor's and master's degree from Texas A&M University Corpus Christi and then worked offshore for two years conducting research in the shrimping industry, including research on red snapper and various shark species. So Sean, if you want to take it away. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. It's always, always uh, uncomfortable to be hearing your resume or your uh, um, bio read out loud, so I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks for having me this morning. I appreciate letting me come in and talk to you guys. Um, Terry set me up very nicely. We've been working with him for a number of years, and so a lot of the stuff that uh, I'll talk about today is going to be directly related to working with Terry and his lab. Um, so again, a, a good kind of segue to going into this uh, kind of on the ground application. So uh, as Hannah said, I work for the River Authority down here in San Antonio. So all of this is going to be applications to bacterial source tracking data in our basin. Um, and as always, you know, most people are going to know this, but just an idea of the expanse of the River Authority uh, kind of jurisdiction and the San Antonio River watershed is the headwaters of the San Antonio River main stem are in San Antonio, but the, the watershed extends all the way to the northwest to Bandera County, Medina County, and then all the way down to um, 
the the coast where it confluences the Guadalupe River and then meets up with San Antonio Bay. So again, I know a lot of times the San Antonio River is always seen as the River Walk, but you know much much bigger expanse than that. So the river itself uh, drains the watershed drains about 4,200 square miles, Maine seems about 240 miles, and we have 13 classified segments, and that's going to be important when we start talking about uh, implementation plans here in a second. And as you'd imagine, it's pretty common. Uh, a lot of these urban waterways is that we have a huge dichotomy between the downtown area. So Riverwalk obviously channelized nothing, nothing natural about it at this point in time to very natural systems farther south. So the picture on the right hand side there is a place called Conquista Crossing about halfway down the basin in Fall City. Um, so you see a, again, much different area. So a lot of times whenever we start looking at bacterial source tracking, uh, there's probably this this maybe a general idea of the picture on the left. There's going to be a lot of bacteria. It's going to be dominated by human sources, uh, pets, those types of organisms, things you would consider you know more urbanized environments. In the picture on the right, a lot of the percep the perception has always been uh, it's going to be agricultural land. It's going to be a lot of cattle. It's going to be a lot of influences from that. It'll be a lot less human, uh, maybe still some, but a lot less human. Uh, that's always kind of this preconceived notion of, of what what the content the content or the makeup of that uh, bacterial pollution is going to be. So we're going to dive into uh, kind of you know the the importance of looking at these two different systems and some case studies here in a little bit. So at the River Authority, the way we kind of think about our approach to monitoring is sort of a three pronged approach uh, and I'm going to I'm going to contradict myself immediately in a second here and, and have a fourth component of this. But the big things are routine monitoring, intensive monitoring, and then we've, we've adopted bacterial source tracking as a as a really important tool for our watershed monitoring and then our watershed management decisions afterwards. And so um, the routine monitoring is, is almost entirely propped up by our clean rivers program. Uh, I'll show a, a map of that in a second of our monitoring stations. Our intensive monitoring is just whenever something comes up, we we will jump at these intensive monitoring efforts. So the picture on the right hand side there, as you can as you can see, it's this is part of the river walk as well. We did what's called an urban reach E. coli project to see are we uh, we have very, very high levels of E. coli in the river walk area in downtown. So we wanted to see uh, are there hot spots in those areas? Are there illicit discharges underneath uh, underneath the surface of the water in the river walk? Is it is it sediment getting kicked up whenever the river boats are going by? So what was going on there? So that was an intensive monitoring example. And then today we're going to talk about a, a few examples of bacterial source tracking. The fourth part of this component is load reduction measures. The reason why, um, you know, I, I imagine a lot of the folks on this call today are directly re directly related to some monitoring efforts in some way or some watershed management components. The reason why we do routine monitoring and the reason why we do bacterial source tracking and intensive monitoring is to eventually be able to recommend watershed management decisions like load reduction measures. So this photo on the left hand side is, is of the San Antonio Zoo. Uh, this is an area that used to have a really high level of, of E. coli coming into the river. And we, we noticed that through our routine monitoring. And so we approached the zoo and, and the zoo was, was very receptive to this and the zoo eventually put in a UV disinfectant system. And so I don't know the exact date that it came online, but you know, maybe a decade or so ago, the, the values coming out of the zoo were in the hundreds for E. coli counts. And now with the UV disinfectant system, the, the E. coli counts coming out of the zoo are, are in the tens and, and 50s, that kind of range, that order of magnitude. So you can see, obviously that's the best case scenario. Identify a source of pollution, find a load reduction measure, go back to routine monitoring to see if that load reduction measure is working, and then hopefully continue to do that throughout the basin to find tangible benefits in water quality. So again, that's a, an extreme example. I know it's always harder to find the smoking gun than this particular example, but when you look at time as well, obviously we talk about, uh, Terry talked about cost. Cost is a huge part of this. Uh, when you talk about time, routine monitoring is the lion's share of the time. If, if you if you're going to be able to make uh, sound watershed management decisions, you have to be able to make it off of good sound data. And in order to do that, you do have to invest a lot of time into the routine monitoring. The flip of that is that if you look at the money part, these load reduction measures are typically very, very expensive. Um, in the top left, you see us putting in permeable pavers at the River Authority headquarters. Um, cisterns are a less expensive option, but you have things like rain gardens and you have, again, the UV disinfectant system. Those load reduction measures can be very, very expensive. So you want to be able to target those load reduction measures in area where you know you're going to get some bang for your buck. 
Routine monitoring is not a cheap part of this process either. But again, you look at the load reduction measures, you're talking about construction costs and all the things going into that, as opposed to that routine monitoring cost, which is a slight, slightly lower cost. Starting to dive into some into some of the base in a little bit more detail. This is our 2022 coordinated monitoring schedule for our Clean Rivers program. Uh, again, you see us. We have we have monitoring stations all the way in the northwestern part of our basin. Uh, those samples in the Medina River upstream of the lake are all collected by the Bandera County River Authority and Groundwater District. They also collect in the lake as well, so we have a really good partnership with them. All the way down to the to the confluence area where we collect some samples, as does GBRA and TCEQ, really close to the confluence. Um, the different colorations are our different uh, sub watersheds and segment areas. Uh, one of the first ones we're going to talk about is the bottom right is that kind of light pinkish reddish color, and that's the lower San Antonio River. We're also going to talk about that that inset on the right. Uh, the purple color, we're going to talk about that. That's the the upper San Antonio. So we're going to talk about an urban example and a rural example. And so again, I've kind of mentioned a couple of case studies here. We have a number of them, but these are four things that we've really we've directly applied bacterial source tracking to to help us make watershed management decisions either internally or through stakeholder driven processes. And so I'm going to go through two of these. But if you look at these four, number one and number three are obviously very stakeholder driven processes and I plan and a watershed protection plan. Uh, the second and the fourth are internal items. Uh, again, we want to, while all of these are, 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 are pollutant characterization efforts, the second and the fourth one were internally driven for us to make watershed management decisions based you know, on some question that was brought up or, or, or some concern that we had internally to really address these questions. Again, where the first and the third are really good interactions with the public. So the two I'm going to talk about today are the first and the second. So lower San Antonio River implementation plan and the San Pedro Creek Culture Park and really San Pedro Creek overall. So just to very quickly, I'm not going to go into any any of the details. Um, obviously, Terry just covered that the really good introduction to bacterial source tracking. So we do have internal capabilities for bacterial source tracking. Uh, we do the HF 183 method, which is the presence absence only for human source markers, looking at bacteroides. We've also partnered with Terry and his lab for the last nine years to send them samples to do kind of the, you know, that source, the three and seven way split is the part that that we've really invested a lot of time and effort into with with Terry and his lab to uh, again, really provide meaningful information for us. So while we can do the presence absence, admittedly, we're still in the, in the process of figuring out how do we apply presence absence data especially in a basin where we are, where it's very effluent dominated. So if you do presence absence, you're amplifying DNA. Well, if you're sampling something coming out of a treatment plant, there's a ton of, of human source E. coli DNA coming out of that. If you get a fragment of that DNA long enough to match with your primer and probe, you're going to amplify that DNA. So you're not necessarily confident that, that is a viable live cell. It could be a dead E. coli cell. So we're still working on how to apply that HF 183 marker to our basin, but we have had a really good success applying uh, the three way and seven way split um, analysis in our basin again through the work with Terry and his lab. So that being said, um, I'm going to start diving into some of this data. So we do have an internal BST dashboard. Um, this is a really, really good resource for us. And like I said, unfortunately, uh, this is not available for public consumption at this point in time. We have this as a Power BI dashboard internally that we really have, have had tremendous success with utilizing this. I've been I've been very fortunate to, to manage this program for us for the last nine years. And I always looked at it in, in kind of pie charts and, and looked at it as an Excel spreadsheet. Whenever you can start visualizing something on the map, it just it means something different. It kind of pops out in a different way. So our data management and analysis team did a great job. And just to kind of walk you through very quickly this this bat, this dashboard, because you're going to see this a few times with other uh, kind of zoomed in areas. So the top left here is counties, ambient and stormwater, and in the years we've done these sampling events. We've done 109 events in the last. Uh, this shows eight years, but we just did recently did a sample set that we have over at over at Terry's lab, and about 1,100 isolates. And so an event is a single, uh, you know, visiting a single water body and scooping up water. Uh, so we may have five events in a day because we, we we typically have four to six sample sites. So if we went out to five sites in a day, that would be considered five events just to kind of contextualize that. 
And this is our breakdown basin wide. So this is a representation of all 1,110 isolates <clears throat> over the over the last eight years. These are all of our sample stations. And then on the map, you can see here we have these different colors. Those are just broken down by county. So you have Goliad, Carnes, Wilson, Bear, and Medina counties. Um, so there's there's no other meaning to that. But we have done these things in kind of batches or phases. So this is just a really quick overview because again, we're going to see that. And the other part I want to point out is um, we have this kind of flow chart just to kind of give everybody an, an idea of, of where we are throughout the presentation, you know, routine monitoring to intensive bacterial source tracking and load reduction. You'll see uh, this little marker here in the corner to kind of give you an idea of where we are in the process of this flow chart. So right here talking about routine monitoring, um, going here talking about the dashboard, you're talking about bacterial source tracking. So just to give an idea of you're going to see those little things pop up every once in a while to kind of keep us in, in line of like what exactly we're talking about. So getting to this first um, application of this, we're looking at our lower San Antonio River I plan. The total maximum daily load for the lower San Antonio was approved in 2008. Uh, this I plan was initiated in 2016 with obviously, with, as all I plans are, a very extensive stakeholder process. We had a lot of meetings with our, our, our Southern County constituents. And as again, as you can imagine, you're looking at downtown San Antonio where we are is significantly different than the lower basin. Now uh, getting that more in more detail in a second here. Uh, these nine, this this extensive stakeholder in, engagement resulted in nine management measures and two control actions. The difference is management measures are addressing non-point source. Control actions are, are measuring point source. So like the control actions are very specifically targeting wastewater treatment facilities. The first thing, almost one of the first things that ended up coming up in this stakeholder process talking with them was what's going on with Escondido Creek. And, and the reason why is uh, this is not this is not showing obviously a big blown up part of all the impairments in the southern basin. The impairment, uh, the, the integrator report we used during the stakeholder process was the 2014 TCEQ assessment. And what really jumped out at people, as as I would imagine most folks know on this call, a lot of these assessment units within segments are broken up by confluences. And so here you can see in the top right this kind of turquoise green color. This is 190105, so Lower San Antonio River uh, Assessment Unit 5, and this was supporting for bacteria. And the downstream thing of that, the, the red section, is 190104, and that was impaired for water, or for, excuse me, for bacterial contaminants, and so was Escondido Creek. So the thing that popped into our stakeholders' minds was the water body was supporting upstream of that confluence, the water body's not supporting downstream of that confluence. That confluence must be the reason. And the other part that jumped out is you see this, this small yellow triangle here east of Kennedy. This is a wastewater treatment facility. So that was a, immediately where our stakeholders went is this is a treatment facility. This is the issue. Escondido Creek causes this issue. Um, and, and that's the problem why we have an impairment further down. Uh, that was just where their minds went. We were talking to them. One thing that really comes into mind is is concentration and loading. Um, and just to kind of give you an example of, of how different these numbers are. So 1905's geo mean was 111, 1904's was 196, and Escondido Creeks was 917. So again, you can kind of see where those stakeholders are, are going. You can kind of follow along logically with what they're thinking. The part that we were talking to them about was load and concentration. So this is a USGS flow gauge. Uh, for um, a year back from yesterday at uh, Escondido Creek right here at 181. And you can see it's typically dry. And obviously this is upstream of the treatment facility. So down here at the confluence, we typically have flow. We have a routine sampling station just upstream of the confluence. The flow is usually between one and three CFS. But again, you, you kind of, you can understand where, where the stakeholders are coming from, why they're looking at it this way. Our perspective was, while there is water quality concerns, our water quality concerns in Escondido Creek, we did not attribute the impairment in 190104 to that treatment plant. So what our stakeholders started asking us was, well, how can you prove this? So what we did is we looked at our routine monitoring and then we decided let's do an intensive survey. So what we did is we looked at from the confluence of Escondido Creek all the way up to FM 792, which is there's a little bit of a fork here from 181. 
So just south of 181 is where we decided to do our, our intensive survey to. So this was, again, from one, you know, looking at uh, the Escondido at 792 is the farthest upstream, the confluence obviously being the farthest downstream. This was five days since the last precipitation event. So again, not a flood event, but by no means a dry, you know, drought condition. I think a really good definition of the word ambient in this case. The two things that really jumped out at us, and you'll see three things referencing Nichols Creek. Nichols Creek is where the treatment plant actually outfalls into. And looking in Nichols Creek, the geomean was only 220. Again, obviously with the state standard for primary contact recreation being 126, so a little bit elevated, but not anywhere near that 916 um, geomean. So that really jumped out at us is okay. That kind of gives us a good idea that maybe there's not a lot of, of contamination going to Nichols Creek. Obviously the flow being very low, again, talks about load and concentration. The other thing that jumped out at us was this 1600 value, uh, seven miles upstream of the confluence. That's our by far our highest value, uh, more than twice any other site we had. So again, that starts kind of piquing our interest. So you can see how we're really starting to kind of narrow down. And at this point in time, narrowing down, we decided it's reasonable to go to bacterial source tracking. So what we did is we looked at five sites. Um, again, as Dr. Gentry said a number of times, one of the big considerations here is cost. Um, you know, to look at all 11 of these sites that that frequently would be a very, very high cost. And so we did look at cutting that down, but still doing a really good characterization of this water body. So we picked these five sites. We went out two times each. So we ended up with 100 isolates for 10 events. Um, again, each one of those events is a site visit. So we did two different site visits um, on June 20th and July 17th of 2017. So if you look at overall 100 isolates, you know, that's, you're looking at a pretty good sample size. You can have a pretty good amount of confidence in that. Each site, less so. Um, so that's why we look at this holistically. But again, we talked earlier about that urban-rural divide and the thought of like, well, all the pollution in the lower basin must be coming from, from, from uh, livestock. All the pollution in the upper basin must be coming from humans or pets or those types of organisms. And what we saw here was that the that 40 percent of the isolates came from non-avian wildlife. So think about deer and possums and raccoons and fox and, and those types of organisms contributing to this. Again, as as was a really good question earlier that's relevant to this presentation, it also includes feral hogs. Um, and so, again, there is a there is a third layer of information that, that Terry will provide us. It is a species level estimate, if you will, you know, it is it's I don't want to call it anecdotal because there's more behind it than that, but it's certainly not publishable information. Um, it is really helpful for us to kind of look at it just to get a general idea. And a lot of those were identified as feral hog. You can see the second one was cattle and then pretty low on that list was human at 7%. Um, Non-avian livestock was the second lowest at 4%. So you can kind of see sort of a trend going on here, right? Wildlife really, really common relative to the other isolates. Humans, pretty low. Cattle, somewhere there in the middle, depending on where you are. Um, and we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail and talk about kind of some interesting parts with the cattle whenever we get up to the urban area of San Antonio. So we looked at this, um, and, and for a number of reasons, we, you know, we, we brought this back to our stakeholder group, and we, we kind of came to some conclusions with them over, over, the, over the discussions that we had. And so of those nine management measures that we had in our plan, three of them were directly related to this bacterial source tracking effort. One of the ones was remove and manage feral hogs. You don't want to have a fox management program. You don't want to have a, 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 you know, to a degree, a whitetail management program. You don't want to have a raccoon management program. You know, those are those are natural organisms. Those are native organisms to the area. You want a healthy population of wildlife. That's what makes you know, nature uh, an enjoyable place to be is all of these native organisms and, and people enjoy that part. But you can do something about feral hogs. And so that told us, well, if, if the, if the non-avian wildlife are the largest problem, let's manage the portion of that that we can. And that was feral hogs. The second one was a really, really good, um, in our opinion, a really, really good thing to see from our stakeholder group was that they recognize the importance of riparian zones. So obviously, if you do have high levels of pollutants, uh, in that area and they're coming from natural native sources. How do you manage that? You don't manage that by getting rid of those organisms. You manage that by having a healthy riparian zone. And so they really advocated and stressed the, the importance of not only restoration and, and, and protection of these riparian zones, 
but also education and outreach materials is making sure that our engaged stakeholders could also pass the information to the individuals that maybe weren't as engaged or weren't as educated throughout the Southern Basin to say, we need to protect our riparian corridors. We can have agriculture, we can do those kinds of things, but let's do maybe cattle exclusion zones. Let's do maybe rotational watering in certain areas so that certain parts of the river can, can be healthier. Um, let's work with our soil and water conservation district to get uh, maybe some pumps away from the river so that there's places for cattle to to uh, uh, you know bathe and, 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 and drink water away from the river so they're not having to get into that water body. So the last one was was really, really good. It was not obviously a management measure in the sense of controlling the amount of, of E. coli, but there was a lot of advocacy for us to coordinate and expand our existing watershed monitoring. Uh, that was really, really good to hear because they recognized the importance of our routine water quality data. They recognized the importance of bacterial source tracking data, and they knew that without that really robust routine baseline data that we would never have gotten to the position to say, we can make these conclusions because we have so much data to support the, you know, the, the claims that we're making. So that was a really, 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 really good engaging process with our stakeholders. We were really excited to go through that whole entire thing. The next one, this is yeah, just an example, like a summary point. I don't, I'm not gonna claim at all that this is because of our implementation plan. I like to think that it helps, but you can see at these three, these, these two assessment units in this creek, the geo means have gone down in all of them and pretty significantly so in 19104 and almost by half in Escondido Creek. So again, I'm not saying that this was because of the I plan. Again, I do like, I would like to say that there's hopefully, fingers crossed, that, that our I plan, that the commitment of our Southern Basin stakeholders resulted in some of these reductions. But you can see even a reduction from 110 is pretty good. You know, you get a couple of wet years and all of a sudden that 110 can become 120, but it didn't, it, it was 105. And so, uh, a really, really encouraging trend to see, uh, and hopefully that trend continues. Uh, you can see 19104 is very close to meeting the primary contact standard. Escondido Creek still has a ways to go, but again, reducing that geomean by 400 over the course of, of, of eight years is, is, is pretty impressive. So um, that, you know, I just wanted to share that with everybody is just kind of, you know, a little bit of an anecdote as well to potential benefits of this I plan. So shifting to the other example, um, I want to switch to the maps for a second here to Google Earth because I want to show the satellite view. As everybody knows, I'm not going to surprise anybody here that San Antonio is a pretty big city, you know, 1.7 million people proper, over 2 million in Bear County. Um, and again, we just talked about the Southern Basin where we had uh, mostly pasture land, uh, grazing land for cattle or other livestock, uh, you know, some ranch land for uh, uh, produce. So completely different environment than up here in San Antonio. And you can see very faintly on the west side of downtown, this system of creeks. This is called the West Side Creek System. I'm gonna keep zooming in here to show some more detail. We're more specifically gonna talk about the San Pedro Creek System. So you can see this blue line is what's considered the lower San Pedro Creek. This is the confluence with San Antonio River. This break here is the upper San Pedro Creek. And what we're really gonna focus on is this area by 10 and 35, even though we did characterize the entire watershed or the entire San Pedro Creek watershed, excuse me. Um, we're really gonna focus here on what's called the San Pedro Creek Culture Park. So you can see this is the highway that I just showed a second ago. This is a structure called the Tunnel Inlet. We'll see it closer in just another, another picture here. And this is a park that was built with uh, funds from Bear County. The River Authority has been a project manager on this and the, the project continues to this day. It'll be completed, I believe, late next year, or early in 2024. But this was a really good thing. This was a, a, just an old drainage channel. So this has been revitalized into a park, you know, kind of a, a, an amenity for the, the residents of downtown San Antonio, but it's also had some issues. And, and so it, it's, a, it's a beautiful place uh, on the left-hand side there. This is that tunnel inlet I just mentioned. So the tunnel inlet, uh, water will come into the tunnel, it'll go underneath the city, it'll come out at the end of San Pedro Creek. We also have a San Antonio River Tunnel that brings water from Upper San Antonio under the city and then comes out uh, just south of town, downtown. So this is the top part by the inlet. This is the, the tunnel inlet's up here in the top of this picture, but this is upstream. So this is the, the opening night and this is the opening weekend. So you can see a really, really good amenity, beautiful place to go. Uh, you know, really nice to get out of, you know, right here in downtown, you can hear flowing water. People love, love going to this place, but uh, there's a, there's a, a, another side to this. And as a lot, a lot of the watershed managers in the call may understand like, oh, that's a, you know, there's some things to kind of consider there. And so you see people over here waiting in the water 
And as as I'd imagine we all know living in Texas, that if you have water in a downtown area, people are going to swim in it in the summertime because it always gets really hot here. So this is not a surprising thing. Uh, what originally happened is this is a feature called the Cascadia. This opening in the rocks here was originally 18 inches deep. And so on the left hand side, you can see you know, kids are walking around, kids are waiting in this water. Originally, people were full on swimming. You know, kids were full on swimming in this water, heads submerged, jumping down into this pool here at the bottom. So originally, our thought was, OK, we've created this amenity and all of a sudden people are full on swimming in this water. The kids are in the water, potential chance for ingestion, poten potential chance for getting sick because the water quality in downtown isn't ideal. So we started thinking, OK, we've taken the responsibility to build this amenity. We need to take the responsibility to then to then be able to communicate to our constituents. This is what the water quality is like, and these are the potential impacts to health should you swim. So what we decided to do um, again, looking at our routine monitoring, you can see this is the West Side Creek system. We have something down here at the confluence of San Pedro Creek. We don't have we didn't have anything up here at the San Pedro Creek Culture Park. So what we decided to do was do something where we sampled every single day and every single day throughout anything. The exceptions, as we all know, the last couple of years were some pretty bad freezes where people couldn't drive. You'll also see a pretty big gap here from March to the end of April. This was our COVID shutdown uh, at the River Authority, where our field staff is only doing things we considered, uh, you know, absolute necessities. So there were some gaps. Uh, there's another gap here from COVID. Uh, so, you know, but for the most part, we were doing this on a daily basis. You can see a lot of data points. This is another example of our of a really good product that our data management analysis team put out. This is a publicly available dashboard um, right here. You can see that um, we have zoomed in on San Pedro Creek Culture Park. I'm not going to take the chance to jump over to the website because there's always a, a you know potential of breaking some things there. So I'm going to stay here. But if, if you zoom out to our full basin, what happens is these boxes over here on the right, these little cards on the right hand side, it will show you how many sites in our basin are meeting the primary contact or creation standard, secondary, secondary contact, uh, secondary or in the primary contact too. And so it'll give you a good idea of, of what the water quality is like in the basin. This is zoomed in just to see the San Pedro Creek Culture Park. You can see some of these values, the geo means 726. So again, you start thinking about are we putting our are we putting our constituents in harm's way by by providing this amenity where they can go and, and be in the water? <laughs> so the next step for that was for us to do bacterial source tracking. We ended up doing nine events, so three sampling events. Uh, we have more information at San Pedro Creek at Furnish downstream, uh, this this very bottom dark purple spot because we did this as part of another phase. Um, we have 30 at St. Pedro Creek Culture Park and less at, at, at it's called Croft Trace up here. But again, the really interesting part to us, we did not expect to see this, is you see almost the same breakdown. We had 40% of wildlife non-avian in our Southern Basin. We have 41% wildlife non-avian here in downtown. And that Escondido Creek Parkway, or the Escondido Creek, uh, uh, Escondido Creek is, runs by Kennedy, which is 3,400 people. And again, as I talked about San Antonio, you're talking about 1.7 million people in the San Antonio city limits. So that that land use could not be any more different. But you can see a huge similarity, a huge level of similarity between these things. Cattle is a little bit less. It was 16 in the Southern Basin, but it's still 9% here. And then human is, is even lower than it was in the Southern Basin. So I think we had 7% in the Escondido Creek Southern Basin and 3% here. But the important thing to, to, to kind of note here is that we've seen pretty similar breakdowns throughout our basin, whether we're doing Medina River west of San Antonio, uh, a lot of the, the, the Riverwalk area, Brackenridge Park area in downtown proper, and then a lot of it in the southern basin has been very similar results that we've seen, uh, again, no matter the land use type, which has been probably the biggest surprise that we've seen throughout this process for the last eight or nine years. So what we did in this case was, OK, we can't there's nothing we can really do as far as a direct reduction. And so what we decided to do, the route we decided to go is education. So at San Pedro Creek Culture Park now, there's two of these signs on the right hand side. You can see it says swimming prohibited and there's a waiting area. The swimming is being prohibited because there is a city ordinance that restricts swimming in the Riverwalk areas. This was not done for. This was not done for water quality concerns. This was done for like physical safety and health. So thinking about people jumping in the river and the river walk, 
How are they going to get out? What if there's a flood event? It was more of a physical safety than it was any sort of pollutant considerations. So that ordinance still applies in these areas upstream and downstream of the waiting area. The waiting area is that shallow part, the Cascadia, where you, on the left-hand side, you can see the kids playing in. But again, we decided to go with education this route because we didn't think we could we could directly address that E. coli issue in a reasonable reasonable way. So it really was, let's go with education in this particular instance. And so those are just two case studies. And just really quickly, lessons learned is, is while that wildlife is the majority, we can still do something about the human part. So that human may be 3%, it may be 5%, maybe 10%, but that's the part that we can act on. Uh, the same thing with pets. You know, pets may be 1% or 5%, but if you're talking about a geomine of, of 800 and you have 2% of 800, like that's, you know, you can still try to make a, a meaningful difference in some of these things. If you're talking about 7 or 8% of, of, of a large number with human, we can still do things about that and still make tangible water quality improvements by directly addressing the concerns that we see, even if the sources are less common than others. Again, the other one too is I think that big urban rural divide is a big thing about, you can make assumptions, but you always should verify what's going on. And the last thing is always properly contextualize your data. Um, Terry touched on this a little bit, but the, the, the routine monitoring really does help. It helps you understand what's going on, what's the situation like before you start this analysis, and then what's going on afterwards. And so um, that's that's what I have to say this morning. There's a, always a good picture for our BST of Larry, one of our biologists, doing a muscle survey with some cows just hanging out upstream with him. So there's no exclusion exclusionary grazing there, but um, happy to take any questions. And sorry if I went a little, little long for everybody this morning. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. That's okay. That's okay. We definitely, definitely ran, ran a little long um, trying to get the webinar started today, but it looks like we've got a question from David Cowan. He said, it looks like your public facing bacteria dashboard is ArcGIS based. Does it link to power by data or do you analyze them separately for visual displays? All of our external stuff is GIS based and it's not on, on the Power BI platform now. We're trying to switch from Power BI, uh, trying to switch from the ArcGIS based type stuff to Power BI for our visualizations. But all of our external platforms are completely ArcGIS based at this point in time. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm not seeing, okay, let's see. Can you or Terry address the percent unidentified component of the splits and hence confidence limits around the identified sources? So in terms of what they represent, the, the reason, so the, the cutoff we use is 80% similarity based on the combined fingerprint pattern to anything else in the library. So it comes back even 79.9%, we consider it unidentified. And that's based on how reproducibly we can do those fingerprints in the lab. Now, in terms of what they are, it could be just the source that we don't have captured or represented in the library, or it could be the source to say from a human that due to the variability in E. coli, we don't have one similar enough to what's being contributed. And that kind of goes back to Michael Amontain's question about sewers versus septage is there may just be an individual that's shedding E. coli that's different enough than anything that we have in the library that we're just not detecting that. And that's one of the goal of continually building the library as we capture more of that diversity that's reflected because you can think about an individual shedding millions and millions of E. coli cells. There's a lot of variability that's in that. So that's one of the challenges with the library based approach. And then hopefully by using the marker and incorporating some of the sequencing approaches, we can overcome that or we can complement that limitation with some other methods that allow us to look at it. And it's kind of like what Sean was talking about with the presence absence versus the E. coli where you're getting a source prediction. So by combining that, hopefully we can get around some of the unknowns about those unidentified isolates. So the follow-up question from Faith, do we need more isolates in the library from people in a specific city? The answer to that is probably yes. And our library has largely been built and targeted to more rural watersheds. This much of the funding has come from the Texas State Cell and Water Conservation Board. And so we've done the majority of our larger watershed studies, at least the ones that are publicly available in more rural watersheds. We've done some work in more urban systems, but those are generally for cities and municipalities and much of that data isn't publicly available. And so the short answer to your question is yes, if, we, if we're going into a location that we don't have many isolates reflected like a specific city, 
then yes, I think we should add more human specific isolates in there. Right. Well, we'll go ahead and jump over to Mark. If you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen, I'll read out your bio. So our next presenter is Mark Enders, um, who is from the city of New Braunfels. So Mark grew up in Central Texas and graduated from Texas State University in 2004 which, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science with an emphasis in water policy and river management. After graduating, Mark worked for a water quality testing laboratory in Austin, Texas. Mark continued his professional career in the Lake Tahoe area, performing watershed management and water quality monitoring duties with an environmental consulting firm. And then he moved back to Central Texas in 2011, where he continued to work in the field of water quality management with the San Antonio Water System. And Mark currently serves as the watershed program manager for the city of New Braunfels, where he oversees the city's MS4 stormwater management program, the Edwards Aquifer Habitat Conservation Plan, and local watershed protection initiatives. Overall, Mark has more than 13 years of experience working to protect surface water quality. And when Mark is not working, he enjoys kayaking the rivers of Central Texas, playing guitar and introducing his daughter to local rivers. So Mark, take it away. Thank you, Hannah. And I assume um, you can see my presentation and hear me loud and clear? Yes, I can. Everything's great. All right. Well, well greetings from New Braunfels. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present on some of the bacteria source tracking that we've done here in New Braunfels. And then also some of the bacteria reduction activities that were kind of born out of uh, the bacteria source tracking analysis that we performed. Um, just real quick overview of the watersheds. Um, both of the, the Dry Comal Creek watershed and the Comal uh, River watershed are located um, primarily within Comal County with a portion of the Dry Comal Creek watershed in Guadalupe County. Um, the city of New Braunfels is within both of those counties. Um, it's along the I-35 corridor. The uh, city of New Braunfels is approximately um, 90,000 residents. Um, again, we're on the I-35 corridor between San Antonio and Austin. Um, you can see here the city limits of New Braunfels in the dashed red area. Um, the, the Dry Comal Creek watershed is about a 110 square mile watershed that extends, um, uh, I guess, I'm sorry, northwest of the city of New Braunfels. It's largely a rural watershed with a lot of large lot uh, single family residential. Uh, the Comal River watershed itself um, is a much smaller watershed. Um, especially when you exclude the um, dry Comal Creek watershed. And so that the, the Comal River watershed is primarily within the uh, city of New Braunfels city limits. Um, a couple things to note here, uh, the Comal River um, is spring fed from springs from the Edwards Aquifer. Um, and so the Comal River um, basically starts within the, the city of New Braunfels city limits. Average discharge of the Comal River and the Comal Springs is about 300 CFS. Um, the Dry Comal Creek, um, as the name implies, much of the creek, um, especially in the upper portions of the watershed, is dry much of the time um, and only flows after, um, you know, good sized storm events. Um, the downstream portion of the, the Dry Comal Creek, I'd say the um, three or four miles that lead in to New City of New Braunfels and, in, and to the confluence of the Comal River, is wetted for much of the year, but the flow rates are, you know, down to, um, you know, typically less than five CFS. Um, and another point to note out is there are very few uh, point source discharges within either of these watersheds. So with the exception of, a, a I believe it's just one industrial discharge um, from a quarry um, that discharges into the Dry Comal Creek, there are not uh, point sources. Basically, here's a map of the Clean Rivers Program monitoring locations that are within the, the New Braunfels city limits. Um, uh, two of these are on the Dry Co or I'm sorry, two of these are on the Comal River. One of these um, monitoring locations is on the Dry Comal Creek. Um, another location is on the Guadalupe River, which currently doesn't have an impairment. So these, these monitoring stations um, our sample for bacteria, E. coli bacteria on a monthly basis by our local river authority, the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. 
In addition to those Clean Rivers Program um, monitoring site, the city sponsors additional um, monthly bacteria monitoring sites. And we, we basically pay the, our river authority to uh, sample these sites in addition to their monthly CRP um, Clean Rivers Program monitoring sites. And so these, these uh, monitoring locations and the sampling efforts at these locations has been in play um, going back to 2016 and some of these locations even back to 2013. So we've continued to, to monitor at these locations on a monthly basis, um, which gives us some, a real good representation of the long-term um, E. coli averages at these, at these locations along the Comal River. Um, additionally, on the Dry Comal Creek, we have also added um, five um, monthly bacteria monitoring stations in addition to the Clean Rivers Program. Um, monitoring location again these these locations give us um you know insight to where bacteria loading may be occurring and then it allows us to kind of look at the long-term um you know bacteria patterns um, at these locations on the dry comal creek the graph here basically shows the um assessment results for both the dry comal creek and the comal river um, as part of the texas integrated report um, so you can see here the blue line is the Dry Comal Creek. It has been listed on the 303D list since um, 2010 and continues to be on the 303D list. Um, the orange line is the Comal River, and you can see that it was initially placed um, on the 303D list in 2016 as it exceeded that um, State of Texas recreational standard for bacteria, that 126 NPN. So as of now, both of these water bodies are on the 303D list. So cluing into the bacteria source tracking, um, we worked with Dr. Gentry in his lab in both 2016 and uh, 2013 um, to, to help identify sources of bacteria in both the Dry Comal Creek and the Comal River. Um, so for each of these events, um, we took three samples and composited those. Um, and in 2013, we did it um, one site on the Comal River, one on the Dry Comal. In 2016, we did two sites on the Comal River and one on the Dry Comal Creek. Um, both times we did the sampling, um, it was performed in the fall, um, in October timeframe. Um, so you can see here in the pie charts, the results, um, these, these results aren't too um, dissimilar from those that were shown for Plum Creek and for some of the San Antonio River Authority, um, San Antonio River data. So you can see here that, um, you know, for Dry Comal Creek, 36% non-avian wildlife um, and 23% avian wildlife with much less proportions of cattle, um, pets and human sources. Uh, for Comal River, very similar results, you know, 46% uh, uh, non-avian wildlife, 18% avian wildlife, um, with some portions or uh, contributions from cattle, um, pets, and humans. So this, the BST analysis that we did with Dr. Gentry's lab, um, it was very timely in that at the same time that we did these BST analysis, the city was working with uh, project partners and stakeholders to develop a watershed protection plan to address the bacteria levels uh, in both the Dry Comal Creek and Comal Rivers. Um, so the BST analysis and the results, um, you know, of course, we use those um, results to help prioritize bacteria reduction initiatives that were included in the watershed protection plan. Um, TCEQ and EPA have accepted that watershed protection plan, and the city is currently taking the lead on implementation um, of the watershed protection plan. Here's just a quick look um, at all of the bacteria reduction measures that are included in the watershed protection plan. Um, you know, going back to those BST results, you, you know, with, the, with a lot of contributions coming from wildlife, we certainly focused and prioritized um, the, the um, urban wildlife and the wildlife management measures. Um, so we also included, um, you know, the, the bacteria source tracking did not show large proportions of um, livestock or human sources, but that said, the BST results, you know, it was a snapshot in time. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were including other sources, even though the BST may have not shown those. And th those would be for livestock sources, 
um, septic systems, which there are quite a few septic systems in the Dry Kamal Creek watershed, you know, to serve those kind of rural um, single family residential communities. Um, we also included some measures for feral hogs, even though I will note that um, in our watersheds, um, there is not the concentration of feral hogs as you would see kind of in areas um, east of I-35, you know, into kind of the Plum Creek watershed and some of the San Antonio River watershed. Um, so, but with that said, we were, there was some concerns that the feral hog populations could grow over time. Um, so we wanted to have some some measures in place to address that um, should feral hog populations surge and we need to do some management to keep um, keep down the bacterial contributions from feral hogs. So most of our urban wildlife measurement management measures are focused on white-tailed deer um, and uh, waterfowl. Um, so an important thing to mention is that um, and I think Dr. Gentry mentioned this in his presentation, it's important to kind of ground truth some of the BST data. And so when we got the BST results, that matched up with a lot of the observations that we were seeing. So certainly um, on the Comal River, we have a large city park that's right at the headwaters of the Comal River. Um, and we were, um, we did some, you know, very basic surveys and found that there were just really big populations of non primarily non-native uh, waterfowl in the park, um, primarily congregating there um, for, from years and years and a lot of historic feeding of the waterfowl. So we that matched up with the BST results that showed kind of the avian um, bacteria source. Um, also with white-tailed deer, um, partially from feeding in the park, but also in residential neighborhoods around um, Land o Lake and the Comal Springs, we have a lot of folks um, that historically have fed white-tailed deer. So it kind of promotes large con congregations of those animals in concentrated areas um, around these waterways. So as part of the Watershed Protection Plan, uh, you know, it includes um, a lot of education and outreach about uh, feeding wildlife. Um, it includes also active management of deer, which we're not currently doing, but it also includes active management of non-native waterfowl, which we have been doing. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And one of the first things we, we did uh, once we got receipt of the, the BST data that showed you know, the large concentrations of bacteria coming from um, wildlife. Um, and once we kind of developed the, the watershed protection plan and included those, um, those wildlife management measures is we needed to reach out to the community um, to raise awareness of urban wildlife issues. And so it was very important to us uh, that the community understand the problems that were resulting from, from large concentrations of urban wildlife and overabundant urban wildlife. So, um, we were in very close contact with an urban biologist, uh, Jessica Alderson with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, so she helped us um, with presentations uh, to city council with public workshops um, to, to the public in New Braunfels to kind of help shed some light on the urban wildlife issues. Um, so we focused primarily on three issues, you know, one being the water quality concerns, you know, certainly um, let folks know that that there was a large contribution of back, you know, the bacteria coming from wildlife. So we basically highlighted that. And in a town like ours, where there's a lot of river recreation around the Comal River, uh, the community and city council took that very seriously. And so that that got a lot of momentum going our way as we moved forward with some of these uh, wildlife management measures. We had also been tracking for some time. Um, deer traffic collisions. So basically you can see the, the bar chart here in the middle that shows the annual number of deer collisions um, that we were having each year. Um, so upwards of 500 um, deer that our animal control services collects from roadsides uh, just within the city limits. So that was another um, issue, negative impact of overabundant urban wildlife that we brought forward. Um, another thing that we focused on um, in Texas Parks and Wildlife um, helped us a lot with this was wildlife health. So they basically shared with the community that feeding, um, you know, human feeding of wildlife, whether it be white-tailed deer or um, or waterfowl, ducks and geese in our parks, we wanted to let folks know that that you know, essentially that uh, feeding um, of those wildlife uh, is not natural and it has negative impacts on the population. 
Uh, for one, a lot of the human food sources are not healthy for the animals, um, but also the feeding basically um, promotes large concentrated um, um, congregations essentially of animals in, in small areas, which is, is um, not only impactful to the wildlife themselves, but also some of the riparian areas where they congregate. So continuing on this, I mentioned a little bit of this, but we did a lot of public meetings around the urban wildlife issue. We did community surveys with the help of, of Texas Parks and Wildlife, where we basically pulled the community to get their thoughts on if they felt um, um, wildlife should be managed um, within the city and their thoughts on wildlife in general. We did a lot of presentations to city council and um, at city council meetings and also workshops with city council. Um, and we work very closely with the media, um, with the local newspaper um, to, to kind of get out news releases about the watershed protection plan and about the urban wildlife issues. So one thing that was included in the watershed protection plan um, that we were able to move forward to, to, to begin to manage wildlife uh, within New Braunfels was that our New Braunfels City Council passed an ordinance restricting the feeding of wildlife within the city limits. So that, that ordinance came into effect um, in 2019 and it prohibits the feeding of all wildlife within the city limits, um, not only on city property, but also um, on private property. So this would be um, you know, restricting feeding of you know, deer with deer corn or feeding um, you know, ducks and geese within our parks. And so there's fines associated with the ordinance and the ordinance is largely enforced by our park rangers and our animal control and food compliance folks. Um, in addition to the ordinance, um, we also put up a lot of signage th primarily throughout Landa Park where, where historic feeding has always been a problem. Um, so you can see some of the examples of the signs that have been put up. Um, we were able to install these signs and, uh, and get them funded through a grant that we got through the EPA and TCEQ. So we're very fortunate to have received some grant funding um, from those agencies to help us implement our watershed protection plan and fund um, educational signage such as this. So this was, this was key to um, you know, helping to inform uh, the residents or the visitors of um, you know some of our parks, a large portion which come out of, um, from out of town um, in the summer. So we were able to get these signs um, throughout Landa Park and through some other parks within New Braunfels to help, help inform folks um, that they can't feed wildlife. It's against city ordinance, but also some of the negative impacts of wildlife feeding. Some of the other wildlife management activities that we're implementing as part of our watershed protection plan. Um, um, is one is the trapping of non-native waterfowl in Landa Park. So, um, you know, some informal surveys that we did early on, we were seeing, you know, upwards of 200 um, waterfowl in the park at one time. Um, you can kind of see it, the image here on this slide shows um, Egyptian geese uh, in Landa Park. You can see the amount of scat and waste that they leave behind right along the water's edge. Um, so we have for the last three years worked with a professional trapping uh, contractor to trap um, non-native waterfowl within Landa Park, um, which is right at the headwaters of the Comal River and right around the banks of the Comal River. Um, so we're primarily targeting Egyptian geese and Muscovy ducks, which were two of the most predominant non-native waterfowl species in Landa Park. And so uh, we've trapped about a little over a hundred um, non-native ducks and geese since we started this program three years ago. Um, we had also done some um, egg coating of non-native waterfowl eggs. So basically working with the biologist to, um, you, you put a thin coat of um, vegetable oil on eggs, which kind of produces them uh, not viable. So you, we were trying to manage the population um, using that method as well. Um, we're also doing, um, working with our park rangers to, um, provide education to park visitors and, and passing out informational flyers on the negative impacts of wildlife feeding. And as I've mentioned too, we have done um, several wildlife management workshops with um, Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're also doing through our watershed protection plan, a lot of education and outreach. Um, a lot of it is just general watershed education, um, non-point source uh, pollution type education, but a lot of this education has embedded in it messages about urban wildlife management and not feeding wildlife. Um, so we 
been doing everything from in-class um, presentations at our local elementary and high school, middle schools, um, but also uh, science curriculum training for the teachers themselves so they can take some of our educational programming about a watershed protection plan and teach that themselves to some of their students. Uh, we're doing education at community event, events and also have put together a nice educational video um, that we get good play and good viewership at a couple local movie theaters. Um, and if you'd like to check that out, I'll have a link at the end of this. It's a real nice three minute video that talks about a watershed protection plan um, and about the, the wildlife uh, management issue or wildlife issue that we have here and some things that you can do to kind of help, um, <clears throat> help prevent or reduce bacteria loading. Uh, with that, I'd ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, you know, here's my email address and phone number if you'd like to reach out to me separately to, to talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, also, here's a link to our Watershed Protection Plan webpage that, um, again, it has a nice um, link to a video that we put together that, that we have in local theaters that really gets a good viewership. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and hopefully this information um, has been beneficial. Thanks, Mark. And again, if we have any questions, we can take those now or we can go ahead and um, take those at the end of today's webinar. And Mark's contact information will be in that follow up email as well. All right, we are running a little behind, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Christina Lopez. If you want to go ahead and get your presentation up and going, I will read out your bio. So Dr. Christina Lopez is the Watershed Coordinator uh, for Plum Creek Watershed Partnership. She received her PhD in geography from Texas State University, where she held several positions, including instructor of environmental geography and research fellow for the National Wildlife Federation and the San Marcos Greenbelt Alliance. As the watershed coordinator, Christina is responsible for promoting and coordinating activities within the watershed, facilitating stakeholder engagements and guiding implementations. So I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Hannah. I appreciate the introduction and thank you for coordinating this as well. Um, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see hear, and see and hear you great. Perfect, thank you so much. I know we're behind on time, so I will try to go through this with brevity. So I'm Christina, I'm the Watershed Coordinator for Plum Creek and I'm gonna talk about the BTS study, the BST study that happened in our watershed and the implications for our watershed protection plans. I'm first going to talk about the Plum Creek watershed itself and give a brief overview of the history of the partnership and how that works into our watershed protection planning. I'm then going to go over the E. coli sources, the results of the study. I'll talk about two major ways we've played that into adaptive management, and then I'll also discuss how that plays into our education and outreach. So first, the Plum Creek watershed, it's already been mentioned several times by other presenters. Um, we are located southeast of Austin. The headwaters is in the Kyle area. That's where Plum Creek begins. It flows 52 miles around Lockhart, down past Luling where it meets the San Marcos River. So the entire watershed is about 400 square miles. Uh, we have a few problems in Plum Creek. And first off, it's impaired for E. coli bacteria since 2004, and there are also concerns for nutrients and in-stream habitats. A brief history of the watershed partnership. So this partnership was first established in 2006 as a pilot program by the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board alongside Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. It began as sort of a pilot program to do a citizen-led voluntary watershed protection plan. It involves 12 entities in the watershed, which are the cities and counties. And then because it is citizen or stakeholder led, it is managed by a steering committee that is comprised of those 12 entities alongside um, landowners. So in 2008, the watershed protection plan was officially approved by the EPA, the first watershed protection plan in Texas. Initially, it was a 10 year project period. Um, as you are aware, it's 2020, so we're well beyond that. And we still have a watershed coordinator, so that's great. The project is still going. In that initial plan um, to try to understand E. coli sources, the select approach was used, 
which is the spatially explicit load enrichment calculation tool. And this tool tries to identify potential sources based on production rates and spatial boundaries. So some likely E. coli sources in no particular order are urban runoff, pets, septic systems, livestock, and wildlife. However, in the original watershed protection plan, a BST was recommended. Now, the watershed protection plan is updated um, every so often. We shoot for about every two years, depending on grant cycles and things like that. So the first update happened in 2012. Those select results were still used to evaluate management measures and adaptive management. And then uh, the BST study was still recommended, just hasn't happened yet. Moving up to 2014 and that update, the study starts to be developed. And then in 2018, uh, with that update, they discussed the source sampling and analysis procedures, as we heard from Dr. Gentry, and then assistance from the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority in collecting some of those samples. And then we were just anticipating the findings in that 2018 update. Finally, in the 2020 update to the Watershed Protection Plan, we were able to implement the results of the BST study and work that into our adaptive management, which I will talk about. So here are the results of the Texas Bacterial Source Tracking Program 2018 for Plum Creek. So the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, or GBRA, collected at five locations over 12 months. Over 230 E. coli isolates were obtained, and out of those, over 100 were DNA fingerprinted. Um, 89% were identified to, through that BSC library that was discussed earlier in the first presentation by Dr. Gentry. So this graph is showing just a basic breakdown, that three-way split. So as we saw with the other watersheds, ours is dominated by wildlife, over 53%, 32% domesticated animals, 4% human, and then 11% unidentified. Um, working with that three-way split, these are the five sites that were sampled across the watershed. And this is the same graph that Dr. Gentry showed. I just have it turned to show an upstream to downstream fashion. The brown bars are the wildlife sources. The yellow is the domesticated animals. And then the green are human sources, gray unidentified. So the big takeaway from this graph is the wildlife sources um, decline slightly as you go further downstream. Then on the other hand, the domesticated animals actually increase as you go further downstream in the watershed. And just for a visualization, this map is showing those sampling sites throughout the watershed. So they are denoted by those yellow dots with the numbers next to them. There are two in the upper portion, one outside of Lockhart, one a little bit further down on the way to Luling, and then one down past Luling near the confluence. So to unpack those results a little bit more, this is that seven-way split. So again, the most dominant source is non-avian wildlife, and we expect that to be largely feral hogs. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar that feral hogs use riparian corridors to travel and deposit other things directly into the um, riparian zone. The second most dominant source at 23% is cattle. I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that similar to hogs, cattle defecate more frequently in streams than in other types of environments. And then um, just to go down the rest of the chart, we had that 11% unidentified, other types of wildlife, and then only 4% human and 1% pets. So I'm gonna talk about our two major adaptive management components that came out of the BST study. And the first is the Central Texas Feral Hog Task Force, and the second one is the creation of focus areas in our watershed protection plan. So first, the Central Texas Feral Hog Task Force was actually started in 2013 by the watershed coordinator at that time. It actually began as a Caldwell County Task Force um, because feral hogs were already a, a likely source of E. coli and they were causing visible damage in the watershed. 
It's now a collaborative regional effort. There's work at Hayes County, still in Caldwell County and Guadalupe County as well. And since this program began in 2013, almost 17,000 hogs have been removed from the Plum Creek watershed. Some of the implications from the study, um, a few really great things came out of that. So it confirmed hogs as a significant source of E. coli and referencing the BST study that was done in 2018 is used in funding applications for ongoing programs. So for example, this year in 2022, we have um, programs for both Hayes and Caldwell County that have been funded by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, the Wildlife Services, and that includes a $5 bounty per tail, educational workshops, a little bit of aerial control, that's mostly in Caldwell County, and then we also have ongoing damage and control surveys that we ask um, landowners and land managers to complete and that gives us an idea of the uh, damage to the physical environment as well as the economic damage of feral hogs in the Plum Creek watershed. Our second major um, adaptive management technique that came out of BSD was creating these eight focus areas in the watershed. So they are highlighted on the watershed map on the right in yellow. Now, we constructed these with our steering committee based on the BST results and local knowledge of where these sources are likely to occur. Um, the goal of focusing on these eight focus areas is try to reduce potential urban and agricultural E. coli sources. So very briefly, you'll notice that the first one right underneath Kyle is one of the only one that's actually on Plum Creek proper. Uh, most of our other focus areas are in these tributaries um, throughout the watershed. To touch on the urban sources, so in these uh, yellow circled areas, those are our majority urban environments. There are still wildlife sources, feral hogs, deer, small mammals. And in the upper portion of the headwaters in Kyle, um, they've actually seen an increase in feral hog activity in the recent months. This photo was sent to me by someone who works for the Kyle Parks and Rec Department. And this is on Plum Creek Trail, which is a three mile hiking trail right in the middle of the city. So um, they're trying to manage feral hogs up there. There's also some sources from domestic animals like pets and a little bit of livestock. Also the human component, again, even though it's just 4%, um, there are wastewater treatment plants that discharge their effluent into the Plum Creek watershed. We actually have 23 um, outfalls. Some of the larger ones are the city of Kyle, um, city of Lockhart as well. We also do have some failing septics in the watershed, um, and those are more in the rural part of Hayes County and the northern part of Caldwell County. Now, one of the things that we've been looking at with our focus areas and adaptive management is land use change. So as Dr. Gentry mentioned, you know, VST is a great tool, but you have to use some other parameters to kind of reconcile what's going on in the watershed as a whole. So since the original watershed protection plan in 2008, um, urbanization is up in the watershed by over 3% and population has increased by over 200%. So with our watershed protection plan, we recommend, and now keep in mind this is all voluntary, low impact development wherever possible, as well as stormwater management. So here are just two examples of projects that fall under those recommendations. First, the city of Kyle has been expanding its wastewater treatment plant. And in addition to the expansion, they're also upgrading it. So we're looking forward to having some um, improved water quality come out of that plant. If you're familiar with the history of the Plum Creek watershed, um, in the early 2000s, 2010s, there were some upsets of this treatment plant that led to um, raw spills in Plum Creek. There's also a new ordinance for the city of Kyle that requires stream buffers or green infrastructure stormwater techniques for new developments. So those are some exciting improvements. And then in the Lockhart area, Town Branch Creek underwent a restoration project. This is a creek that flows through the city of Lockhart. 
um, and is a tributary to Plum Creek. So one of the major things that came out of that was these grow zones as pictured here. And then there's a great example of low impact development at the Caldwell County Justice Center, which is located in Lockhart. It's the old Walmart actually. Um, so there's rainwater harvesting and then a rain garden there. Now to touch briefly on the agricultural sources. So again, showing the map of the watershed, these yellow areas are um, largely ag or livestock. So again, wildlife, feral hogs, um, deer, small mammals probably. But if you recall that graph, as you go down the watershed, domestic animals, particularly cattle, start to increase. Again, coupled with um, land use change in the watershed since the original plan in 2008, forest cover is actually down by 9%, pasture and hay up almost 17%, and then no change in cultivated crops, which stands at about 11% of the land use. So through our watershed protection plan, we recommend water quality management plans, um, and we work closely with the soil and water conservation district technician to implement those and one aspect of those would work to remove cattle from in those riparian zones and provide an alternative water source. Um, and then, of course, we continue to recommend best management practices um, to try to alleviate some of this E. coli from reaching the stream. Our education and outreach of the BST really helped us identify some areas in the watershed where we could target some programs. So for our urban sources, we have pet waste education campaigns in the cities, city of Kyle, city of Lockhart. There are now over 50 pet waste stations throughout the watershed. We expect that number to increase as there are many developments coming in. Um, we co-host workshops such as healthy lawns, healthy waters. And then for our livestock and ag sources, we co-host Lone Star Healthy Streams, which is coming to our area in June. Again, we work closely uh, with the water quality management plans, and then we also co-host riparian trainings with the Texas Water Resource Institute. And then for wastewater sources, we work with GBRA to monitor the outfall of seven um, of the larger outputs of wastewater treatment plants in the watershed, um, and then we keep an eye on those data. We also try to work with homeowners who are on septic systems to educate them and have workshops. Um, I actually work closely with the Environmental Enforcement Unit for Caldwell County to make sure that people are in compliance with that. And then finally, for our wildlife sources, since we believe they are dominated by feral hogs, we have the Bounty Claim Program. I work closely with the Central Texas Feral Hog Task Force on that. I usually run the Bounty Claim events. And then we plan to host several feral hog workshops and webinars um, in the coming months, which typically happens every year. There are two other things in the works. Um, so first, the Plum Creek Wetland Preserve is managed by the Guadalupe Blanco River Trust. It is in the Plum Creek watershed, and it's about um, 265 acres. It's just north of Lockhart and they are working to restore native species and watershed function. This is a mitigation project of wetlands um, from TxDOT, and so there are about 29 ponds in this um, restoration project, and about two miles of Plum Creek flows through that. And then right now, the first step that they're taking in their restoration project is to try to get rid of the feral hogs. And then in the more urban side of things, in the city of Lockhart, we are working with stormwater and soil health. Um, there's a stormwater drainage issue where it's cutting in to the bank and exposing the roots of some very large oak trees. So we're working with Texas State University environmental engineers to try to do some green infrastructure for slope protection and then also some head cutting stabilization that's happening in this small park. Um, and a component of that project is community engagement to try to get folks to um, understand how storm water affects water quality and things of that nature. So just to summarize the E. coli sources that we now know in order, thanks to the BSC study, are feral hogs and wildlife, followed by livestock, humans, and then pets. And some of our adaptive management techniques that have come out of this 
our, it helps guide our updates. Um, we just wrote the 2022 update that is under review at TCEQ right now. Like I mentioned, the Feral Hog Task Force, those numbers really help us in our funding applications that we can point to them being a major contributor. It helped us develop those focus areas, helped us target our outreach and education. And then we can look at um, the population and land use change and try to understand if those E. coli sources may change. And then it also helps to inform our restoration projects. And that is what I have for you all today. Thank you so much. Um, I know that we're cutting into lunchtime. I'd be happy to take any questions, but I will say for some reason, I cannot see the chat. So maybe Hannah can inform me if there's anything in there I need to be aware of. I can definitely, I can definitely. do that. Okay, so we've got a question here from Luna Yang. Uh, were the eight focus areas identified based on the select estimated potential E. coli loadings by sources? Um, my understanding, I was not the watershed coordinator when these were selected, is that they came out actually of the BST results and the local knowledge of the steering committee. So I don't think that the select um, results were a a large factor in trying to identify those focus areas. Okay, we've got a question from David Cowan. What's the general perception of the bounty program? Have you heard from the public, especially in the urban parts of the watershed? That's a great question. So out in Caldwell County, we have the bounty program in Lockhart. Um, there's a, a lot of participation, a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, it's kind of like, a game to them, which is great for us. In Hayes County, not a lot of participation. Um, I've gone, I've done bounty claim events where no one shows up. So, um, but overall, we haven't had anyone like PETA protesting or anything like that. A lot of people do understand that feral hogs are problematic. Um, so, yeah, it is very different based on the more urban area versus the rural. Awesome. Well, um, I'm going to skip back. It looks like we might have had a question for Mark um, about perhaps there might be different BST results if you sampled in the summer. Um, that's a good question. You know, hard to say. Um, you know, I would say the net, if we do decide to do BST in the future, we will probably look at doing that in the spring or the summer. Awesome. Well, let me share my screen back here really quickly. Again, we'll be continuing to take questions, but I know that we're almost about five minutes over time. So I'm going to skip on to upcoming events and meetings that we have for the TMDL program and for COG. Um, we've got an avian management webinar coming up on May 10th. So look out for some information on that in the coming weeks, as well as a few upcoming meetings as well. The coordination committee for the TMDL program will be meeting on June 15th, and the Upper Trinity River Basin Coordinating Committee will be meeting on August 16th. And you can find more information about these meetings and add them to your calendar by visiting Environment and Development's events page.